You're blowing up these days. How you doing, Timothy? You around? There he is. There he is. All right, cool. Can I hear you? Let's do that check. Yes. There right, it is. Speak? Yeah, that works. So for people that do not know you, uh, it's pretty hard not to these days, but... You were a researcher. You were doing all kinds of crazy stuff at Facebook. And then you said, you know what? I could do this on my own. I'm going to go and start a company. You guys raised a massive round that was all the talk a few months ago. And now you released the open source model, which a lot of people are loving because, of course, it has some very, very cool, dare I say the word again, because this is the buzzword bingo, one of the words, SOTA. It is SOTA, right? And so I'm excited for you to talk all about your learnings as you've gone through the creating of these models and then serving them. And I know you got a presentation prepared for us. Uh, yeah. So I think I filled out the abstract a bunch of months ago, uh, and then I wrote this presentation in the last two days. Uh, as after you should. As you <laughs> should. Um, and so I think um, what I'm going to talk about is whatever um, I found useful in understanding what's important for model inference. Uh, a lot of this talk is based on stuff I found online or stuff I found out experimenting. Um, with the first the Lama release and now uh, this one at Mistral, I think we've always been more focused on um, the cost of inference rather than the cost of training. Uh, and so I guess this talk describes uh, what goes into the cost of inference, uh, how to manage throughput latency, uh, what matters for those. Um, can I click yes? So for some context, uh, I guess this won't be a surprise, but lots of people want to deploy uh, large language models. And so I'm going to talk about deploying your own large language models uh, and with open source tools. There are ways to use uh, great public APIs. Uh, you're welcome to do this as well, uh, but that's what I'm interested in. And so we'll dive into the details of what matters to deploy a 7 billion parameter model. Uh, lots of what I'm going to say also applies at larger sizes, uh, but then you need to use uh, more GPUs, and there are uh, a few things to add. Uh, so I'll give a reference that goes into all those details, but some of the stuff I'll say should apply. So we'll start with uh, what metrics matter, um, then what drives these metrics, both at the hardware level uh, and the software level. Uh, then I'll a bunch of tricks that uh, we can use to make things better. Some of those uh, still are not implemented everywhere as far as I know. Uh, lots of those are things that um, are. And then uh, I spent yesterday trying to just run a bunch of models on a bunch of different uh, hardware, uh, try to get curves because I think real life example good. Uh, and so I'll talk about those um, numbers and then I'll conclude. Um, okay, so first, what metrics are we interested in? Uh, first is the throughput. Uh, expressed in query per second. Uh, we want to maximize this for uh, batch jobs or if we want to allow more users to use our service. Uh, second is the latency expressed in second per token, so how many seconds it takes to output the next token. This drives how fast or how snappy your application will look. So in ChatGPT, it's pretty fast. Um, and the smaller model, the easier it is to get this uh, really, really quick. So we want to minimize this for user experience. A good threshold to keep in mind is 250 words per minute, I think, is the average reader speed. And so as long as your latency is uh, below this, um, your users won't get bored. Uh, and then cost, of course, cheaper is better. OK, so now I'll dive uh, deeper into what drives these metrics. Uh, a short in everything that follows, I'm only going to talk talk about the aggressive part of decoding, where we have uh, batch size tokens that we're trying to forward through the network uh, to figure out the next batch uh, tokens. Um, this exclu excludes the part, uh, the first part of processing when the query comes in and there is a maybe large prompt, uh, which is sometimes called the pre-fill part, where we forward lots of tokens at once into the network. This part of the processing is usually uh, already quite optimized, so it's a bit less uh, challenging. 
So with that in mind, we're going to be interested in the inference for a model of size p. Uh, you can assume that p is 7 billion because we like that size. Um, and so in order to uh, perform one step of inference, we're going to require roughly two times the number of parameters times the batch size flops, where flops is floating point operations. And doing these flops, we'll need to load the entire model into the part of the GPU that actually runs the computation. And so we'll need to load the entire model once. Uh, so roughly uh, the number of parameters in memory movement. Um, what's interesting about these two quantities is that the first one um, is bound by a quantity that is the hardware flops. So the number of floating point operations that your GPU can achieve. And it is linear in the batch size. So that's the growing line uh, on, my, uh, on my figure. And the, the amount of memory movement doesn't change with the batch size. Uh, that's true until you have very, very large batch size. But as I've said, this case is already pretty much optimized, so we don't really care about it. Um, so we have a constant quantity, which is uh, the size of the model divided by the memory bandwidth. Uh, and that is the minimum amount of time that you'll require to load everything once in memory. And you'll have to redo this each time. Um, and then we have a moving quantity, which depends on the batch size. And they cross at an interesting point, um, which doesn't depend on anything but the hardware. Uh, and so, for example, this quantity, which is two times the uh, total number of flops the hardware can achieve divided memory bandwidth, is 400 on an A10G and A100. Um, and so this batch size is super interesting because below this batch size, we're pretty much wasting flops uh, because our computations are memory bound. We're just waiting on things to load on the GPU uh, and computing too fast. The latency in part of the graph is constant. And if we go beyond B star, uh, then the latency starts to increase and we're compute bound. So what's really nice about this B star is that at exactly this batch size, it's a regime where uh, the latency is optimal, so user experience is optimal, uh, but also we're not wasting any flops. Uh, so we're paying the right amount of dollars. Um, however, our ideal batch size B star is 400, uh, which seems to be quite a lot. So let's run a bunch of numbers. For a model size uh, like Llama here, um, so it's 7 billion, but there are a bunch of differences with Mistral. So I'll just take Llama. Um, we have a dimension of 4K and 32 layers. Um, the model size that's used by the model is quite easy to compute. Uh, it's two bytes per model weight in FP16. So we just uh, do two times seven and it's 14 gigabytes in memory. And then we have the KV cache. The KV cache is used uh, to store computations so that when we redecode a new token, we don't have to uh, rerun all of those computations. This KV cache is of size two because we have both K cache and V cache, times two because we're in FP16. And then we have one KV cache per layers uh, and we have to save things for each element in the batch, uh, uh, one token per, uh, per position in the sequence and then times dimension. So if we plug actual numbers in this formula, we find that we require about two gigabytes of memory per element in the batch uh, for a maximum sac length of 4K. And so we figure out that on an A10G, uh, I don't know why there is a G there, uh, but on an A10 uh, with 24 gigabytes of memory, we have a maximum batch size of about five, which isn't much. And on a much bigger A100 with 80 gigabytes of memory, we only have a maximum batch size of about 33, uh, which is still way below 400. And so it seems that for all practical use cases, we're inferencing with uh, a 7B model, our decoding is going to be severely uh, memory bandwidth bound. This also shows something that uh, we've been very careful with from the start at Mistral. Um, the size in memory of your model and of your KV cache um, really impacts uh, the maximum batch size that is allowed. Uh, and this maximum batch size is what makes things efficient or not. So I'll now dive into a few tricks 
uh, that have been uh, already done before, uh, but that uh, I like and are just good ideas. <laughs> Uh, and that some of them have made their way into Mistral. Some of them uh, are more at the deployment uh, software level. Some of them haven't made their way uh, into Mistral yet, but yeah. So the grouped query attention um, is a way to reduce the KV cache size by using less queries, uh, less keys and values per query. Uh, it was used in Llama 2, but only for the larger model sizes, not for the 7B. Uh, so in a standard multi-head attention, you have exactly as many keys and values as you have queries. In grouped query attention, uh, one key value pair is associated to a bunch of queries. Uh, in Mistral, we use uh, four queries per keys and values. And so the amount of flops that you're going to do is going to stay the same, uh, but you only have uh, one fourth of the cost in memory. Uh, so that's a simple trick, um, which doesn't really Heard performance, uh, and so it's just a good thing to do. Then there is quantization. Quantization, we haven't worked specifically on it, but that was something that was uh, that developed quite quickly um, after, especially the Llama release, where lots of great off-the-shelf solutions were used by many people in the open source world to provide uh, int eight or int four versions of the models. Uh, what happens with int 8 is that you divide the model size by 2, within 4 you divide it by 4. It doesn't change the optimal batch size because the ratio is just dependent on the hardware, uh, on nothing else. Um, in terms of uh, computation speed, um, it should be about 2x. We've found that hard to reach with the shapes of our models and of a bunch of models. Uh, we found that it's more reasonable to expect about 1.5x. Uh, that's kind of what we've seen in terms of like pure flops. Um, 2x seems hard to reach, but we haven't spent that much time on it. Uh, within Tate, you also mechanically increase the available memory for KV cache. Um, and one thing that you're going to um, immediately divide by two is the time you spend loading the memory in uh, the model in memory. So if you're in the memory bound regime, everything will be twice as fast, uh, which is nice. Uh, what's also nice is that there is no loss of precision or very little loss of uh, precision for int8. Uh, everything seems to work just as well. Uh, there is some loss of performance at int4, uh, but it seems that it can be recovered with QLORA or if you only care about specific uses, um, then I guess like this can work as well uh, and it'll be much cheaper to serve. Um, another great trick is page detention. Uh, so the, this is from the VLLM folks uh, at Berkeley. The KV cache without page detention is rectangular. Uh, you allocate a big old rectangle of memory uh, where one dimension is the batch size, the, number, the maximum number of sequences your model can work on um, at once. And then the other dimension is the maximum sequence length that you allow uh, people to use. And so when a new sequence comes in, you allocate an entire row just for this user. And that's a bit sad because it's likely that maybe 10% of your users are going to use the, the, full, uh, the full row, uh, but it's also likely that most of your users are just going to do short requests. And so you're, and you end up wasting a lot of precious space in your uh, device memory. What page, atten what page detention does um, is that it allocates blocks um, in, uh, in GPU memory. So you first load your model um, so that you know how much space you have left. And then everything else you fill up with memory blocks. Uh, these blocks can, can contain um, up to, I don't know, 16, 32 tokens. And when a new sequence comes in, you allocate as many blocks as it's going to need for the prompt, and then you slowly grow them as needed. So uh, in this drawing I've made, uh, you can see that sequences are not necessarily allocated on contiguous blocks. Uh, so for example, the orange or blue or uh, green uh, are not on contiguous blocks and that doesn't matter. Uh, what this allows is a much better granularity and control over the memory allocation. And so in this uh, drawing, everything that is completely free on the right is uh, free to be used for new sequences that comes in. And as soon as a sequence finished decoding, you can just release the used blocks. So that's very nice. I think at the time they claim like 20x throughput increase uh, compared to um, the standard implementation, which doesn't sound that far off. 
Uh, one trick that we've added uh, in Mistral is a sliding window attention. So we've trained our model to only use the past um, K tokens in the cache. So um, this is great because it al allows us to have a fixed cache size. So we know that once a sequence grows beyond uh, sliding window tokens, we can just rotate in the cache and start overriding, uh, and this won't matter. If you need more insight into why this still allows us to use uh, context length bigger than a uh, sliding window, uh, we've made a short description of this in the blog post or on the GitHub. Um, so the good implementation for this is to see the KV cache as a rotating buffer. So in this drawing at time t, uh, we're inserting into the last position of our cache. And then at time t plus one, we're going, we're growing beyond a uh, sliding window. And so we just overwrite. And this is really easy to implement because positions in the cache never matter. Uh, everything position related is encoded uh, with position embedding. So uh, it's all good. It's really easy to implement and it's, it works well. Another trick is continuous batching. So as I said, uh, the pre-fill phase processes many more tokens simultaneously than the decoding phase. And so you can try to batch these tokens together with the decoding tokens. Um, one thing I've noticed in both VLM and TGI um, is that one thing they do not do is try to chunk uh, the pre-fill phase. So if one user sends us uh, a prompt with like 4K tokens, uh, this will increase the latency of everyone because we'll we'll spend a bunch of time working on these tokens all at once. Uh, and it's a bit of a waste because we're not anymore in the optimal regime uh, where we have low latency and optimal compute. Um, and so one thing that could be added to these uh, software is chunking of the prefill where you only process K tokens at once. Uh, and this would allow being much more granular uh, in how you allocate your resource and would allow batching, uh, decoding, and prefilling uh, much better. Um, okay, what other tricks do I have? Code. Uh, so at these model sizes, code is quite important. Uh, and I think you can usually see that Python code overhead is large. I haven't profiled exactly VLM and TGI, uh, but it's running Python code. And my experience is uh, it usually has overhead at those sizes. Uh, there are mitigations without losing too many of the benefits of Python. Uh, Xformers repo has an amazing example of using CUDA graphs uh, to achieve no overhead. Um, NVIDIA has been teasing their Tensor RT LLM, uh, which is another way of um, basically tracing your inference uh, and then using some pattern matching to make everything faster uh, automatically for you, which sounds nice. Uh, and then you can also use uh, the right custom kernels uh, like Fusion to reduce memory bandwidth. So you, instead of like shuffling things around in memory, there are things like activations that you can do while things are already loaded. Uh, usually you find those online and just plug them in. So uh, just to summarize, uh, the things that drive throughput and latency are the fixed flops to memory bandwidth ratio of your hardware. This gives us a minimal batch size B star that avoids uh, wasting flops. And this only depends on the hardware, not really on the model, unless you're using an exotic architecture that is not the transformer. Um, we have limited on-device memory, which makes it not super easy or not completely trivial to reach uh, the optimal batch size. And on the two uh, libraries I've checked uh, that are open source to uh, deploy models, um, they're still running Python code, which at these sizes uh, incurs a bunch of overheads. Um, I also looked at Faster Transformer, which has no overhead, but is uh, much harder to deploy. Uh, lots of these infos are just uh, taken from this uh, great blog post. So feel free to go there uh, and get into deeper details if you want. Um, so now let's talk about the throughput latency plane, which is um, how I usually look at these metrics. So in this plane, we have in the x-axis, the latency, and in the y-axis, the throughput, and the direction we're interested in is going up and to the left, where we have better throughput and less latency. 
Um, so if you buy better hardware, uh, it'll shift your curve. Uh, whoops, I think I skipped a thing. Yeah, for fixed hardware, um, the regime at the bottom left is fixed latency, uh, which is the memory bound uh, regime. And then as your uh, batch size increase, uh, you're getting in the linear regime of uh, flops bound. If you buy better hardware, it'll cost you more, but everything will shift up and to the left, which may or may not be interesting. And if you get better code um, or better models, uh, everything, so the most of the impact will happen in the um, low throughput regime where you will, um, in the low, uh, in the low, yeah, latency regime where you will increase, increase throughput. It will have less impact uh, at large batch sizes because things are already uh, easy to optimize. So some examples, results, some disclaimers. I did this uh, yesterday quite quickly because provisioning, uh, I provisioned like Mistral and Llama. Uh, this was quite easy. And then I ran the VLLM benchmarking script. Um, I don't know if these results are absolutely the best results you can get, but I think they're directionally correct. Uh, and I copy pasted Matlab, Matplotlib plots, so you might be blind after this. Um, so this is Mistral versus Llama. So this is just a change in GQA, which gives us like 1.5x the throughput on VLM, with the black bar being like um, the human reading speed. And I'll go through this quickly. I'm almost done. Um, the this is changing the hardware. So A10 versus H100 and the same model. And we can see that uh, even though the H100 is much more expensive, it's also very fast. And so it can be worth it uh, to just change hardware instead of buying more uh, of the old hardware. So to conclude, um, it's really easy to serve small model uh, on small instances with open source code. It works quite well. Uh, without doing anything, I think uh, I can get Mistral 7B on an A10 to serve a million requests uh, for like $15 a day, which isn't that much. Um, changing the precision would just double the amount of requests served, uh, pretty much. Uh, the open source deployment solutions have done an amazing job uh, at being very usable. I think there is a lot of work to be done on the actual uh, model code part. Um, and yeah, I think I've given a bunch of tricks that uh, have been or will be implemented. So I guess things will just keep getting faster for everyone, which is nice. And that's it. If you got any questions. Oh, there are questions, my man. Merci beaucoup. That was awesome. I really appreciate it. And I think I knew it was going to be a good talk when you came out and you told us that I wrote the abstract a month ago, but I wrote the actual presentation last night. So <laughs> it may be a little bit different. I love that. There are some awesome questions coming through in the chat right now. The first one is about... What is the best way to decide on which the best processor to use for a certain model? And I just want to tag on top of that because it's kind of in the same vein. When would you use a dedicated AI accelerator system like those from Samba Nova? Uh, I haven't tested uh, dedicated AI hardware. I think I've tested uh, a bunch of GPUs uh, and I even haven't run any of the models on my MacBook because uh, I don't know, haven't found the use for it yet, yeah. but I might. Uh, I think for users, like if you want to just chat with the model, it's much better to just run it on your MacBook. Mm. Uh, that's just much cheaper. Uh, the indication I gave, like the lowest bound for when it uh, becomes useful to use an A10 is a million requests a day. Uh, I mean, that's like $15. Uh, if you can afford $15 a day, then go for this. It'll be easy to deploy and it'll just work. Um, then to know what size of hardware to use, uh, my strategy, since it's so easy to deploy everywhere, is just to start with the cheapest and increase if I don't have the throughput or the speed I want. That's awesome. So the other one is uh, talking about, So I mean, there's so many great questions that are coming through here. I'm just going to go by the ones that are the most upvoted. And somebody's asking, why are, why are companies finding it strategical to open source LLMs? Especially, I mean, you guys just did it. What was the rationale and thought around that? Um, I mean, it's a, it's a good 7B. I think we found it fun and there are a lot more things in the work. So uh, this lets like the community develop things on top of our work. It's been great for Lama. I mean, the the use of it just exploded. 
Uh, I mentioned the, uh, the quantization work, but all of the grid serving methods, I think, uh, really uh, were boosted from that because it just got super easy to deploy good models. So, yeah, I mean, I think, for example, Lama.cpp, which allows things to, uh, which allow people to run things on Mac was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a great community to feed great model to. So, <laughs> Awesome. So to reduce overhead of Python, do you recommend using Mojo? Have you played around with that at all? Not at all. My first experience trying to reduce overhead was Kudograph. It was a bit painful at the time to debug, but it's gotten better. And uh, I think the Xformers example is a great uh, showcase of this. It's, uh, I think also torch.compile might at some point be a good way of doing this. Uh, I don't know where they are with variable sequence length and everything, but yeah, I'd really recommend CUDA graphs as the first, uh, that, that would be my go-to right now. Excellent. All right. Uh, this one is a bit uh, different, but feel free to take take the fifth. How do you think about ethics in your work at Mistral, in particular when it comes to selecting training data? Uh, so we don't do any. We don't talk about anything regarding training. We only talk about what we release and what people can deploy. Uh, about ethics, I think we like to think it's better to tack on moderating systems on top of the models, uh, rather than try to really bake it in immediately. So I am in the camp that thanks you for that. And I know there are a lot of people that also thank you for that. And I just wanted to mention that it's so nice to see that as an option now, because up until now, it feels like we haven't had that as an option, right? Yeah, it's a bit of a different posi position, but I think it's reasonable. I think it also comes from our, our position as being a bit more enterprise focused in terms of business, mm. where in an enterprise setting, it's quite easy to convince people that they can moderate things however they want. Uh, and if they don't expect internal user to do weird things, then that's fine as well. So you you mentioned the uh, GPUs and like the A100s and the H100s and that trade-off and you showed that graph and I, I love the not on that exact graph but you said and then it goes up and to the right if that's important or not important to you but there is somebody that's asking what's the best way to decide on which the best processor to use for a certain model is yeah so i just try them in increasing so uh, one thing i've mentioned is that uh, in my graph i think it was worth it to use an H100 versus a bunch of A10, uh, cost-wise. Uh, the problem is also often availability. So I'd go in order of cost and order of availability. I try them. Uh, it's if you try them for like 20 minutes, uh, it's quite cheap. It's the about the time it'll take maximum to run your benchmarks, uh, and then you get exactly uh, the cost and performance for your use case, uh, which I think is better. All right, last one for you, man. This is speaking to the French roots that you have, I think. What would be the most efficient strategy if we would want a LLM to be multilingual, understra understanding French, for example? Today, data sets are in English ma mainly, so fine-tuning is not as efficient with non-English data. Yeah, I mean, everything that... Um gives new capabilities to uh, LLMs has to do with the data. So step one would be to get uh, data in the language that you target. Uh, I think all LLMs are trained on Wikipedia, which is a great base. Uh, and that's why, for example, uh, I mean, even without much effort, the model can speak a bit of French, um, making them more multilingual. I think the trade-off is as long as you, uh, if you start making them better at French, uh, uh, you'll lose a bit in other language, uh, maybe not necessarily noticeably, um, but if your goal is to target benchmarks, um, then you might lose in English because you've lost like 0.1% and you gain 10% on all other lang languages. Um, so yeah, I guess like first get some multilingual data, um, then train on this. And if you lose 0.1% in English, maybe that's not so bad uh, because you'll just gain so much in other languages. Dude, awesome. And 
Thank you so much for coming on here and doing this. This is really cool. I love how it coincided. I know we talked about do, getting you on here like, what, two months ago, and it coincided with the release of the model. And so I'm very happy to see what you all are doing. I'm excited that you dropped a few little breadcrumbs saying that there's more to come. I would expect nothing less from you, to be honest. And I appreciate you giving this talk. Thanks.